But I'm so blessed to be with you today, and it's just an honor for me to be out here, and I really admire this, uh, the folks at this seminary. This is a great school, and I'm glad to be here and present the ultimate proof of creation. I am with the Institute for Creation Research, and what we do is we re research uh, those aspects of origins, and we show people that the science confirms what the Bible teaches in Genesis. They don't have to modify Genesis to match the latest pseudoscientific claims. Uh, rather, we look at science in light of what the infallible Word of God says, and we find that science lines right up with that. It makes sense. Uh, what I want to do this morning is give you an ultimate proof of creation, and I really mean that. It's an ultimate proof. Uh, as we're out there evangelizing, making disciples of all nations, teaching people to obey, to observe all things that the Lord commanded, there are objections to that, right? Objections come up. No, you can't trust the Bible because of this, that, and the other. And what apologetics is all about is helping people over those objections, removing those stumbling blocks. And of course, we can't make people convert. That's up to God ultimately, but we can help them. We can remove stumbling blocks. And what I, what I want to share with you this morning is an argument that is very, very powerful that really blows away a lot of those stumbling blocks. And uh, it's, it really is an ultimate proof of creation because a lot of times folks will say, well, is there, you know, there's all this scientific evidence and, and it confirms creation. Praise God, it does, of course. But is there one argument that I could master that just blows them all away? And the answer is there, there is. It's a little different than what people are expecting. Uh, I've got a method that works every time in the sense that it, it, I, I can present an, an, in a, an irrefutable uh, proof of the Christian worldview that separates me from some uh, Christian scholars I know, but I believe the Christian worldview is objectively provable. Uh, it, you, you have to do it in the right way. We can't do it by appealing to some greater standard than the Scriptures because there is no greater standard than the Scriptures. But nonetheless, the Bible's self-attesting. And what I want to sh present to you, therefore, is an ultimate proof of creation. And the method that I'm giving you is not just a proof of creation. It's a proof of the Christian worldview. It'll work on any anything that dares to challenge God. And when I give you this ultimate proof and you use it on people, and I would encourage you to do that, you may find that they may or may not convert. They might say, well, yeah, you got me there. I, I've got to be a consistent creationist, got to be a Christian. I've had that happen. But they might not say that. And we people get, get discouraged and they say, well, it didn't, it didn't work. You know, well, it, it, it did work. It accomplished what God wanted it to accomplish. But sometimes people harden their hearts. We, we know that. Uh, there's a difference between proof and persuasion. What I'm giving you is proof, something that is objectively a good argument where the conclusion follows from the premises, the premises are true. Uh, what, you can't persuade people in the ultimate sense. We want to be persuasive in the sense of urging them, I understand that, but it's up to the Holy Spirit ultimately to bring ultimate conversion. I'm just going to give you an irrefutable argument. So they may or may not convert, but I can guarantee you this, they won't have any logical comeback. Just because you don't cry uncle doesn't mean I don't have you in a headlock, right? <laughs> yeah. So... And people say, well, if, if there's a proof of the Christian worldview, is what about faith? Does that undermine faith? And the answer is no. Uh, people sometimes have a misconception of faith, thinking that it takes over where reason leaves off or something like that. No, biblically, faith is when we have confidence in something that we have not observed with our senses. And that comes very close to the definition given in Hebrews, for example. But uh, no, faith is necessary for reason. In fact, that's, that's going to be part and parcel of my argument here, is that Unless we presuppose Scripture, we can't really know anything about anything else. It's, and it's a very powerful argument. I want to start with some lines of evidence that are good confirmations of creation, but are less than an ultimate proof, so that by way of contrast, we can see how the ultimate proof differs. One line of evidence involves information theory. Information studies how information science or information theory studies how information is transmitted. And there are several laws of information science. Dr. Werner Gitt, who wrote the book, In the Beginning Was Information, and he's a, a really brilliant uh, <coughs> Christian scholar, but he, um, he points out that whenever information is transmitted, it never, uh, you never gain information in the process of transmission, and when you, therefore when you follow information backwards along those, the chain of transmission events, it always leads to a mental source, the mind of the sender. Information always comes from a mind, ultimately. Now, inanimate machines can copy information and replicate it and so on, but they can't create brand new creative information. Can't do it. Computers can copy it, transmit it, but they can't make it. Minds create information. And that's very interesting because, of course, in DNA, what do we have? Information. 
the instructions to make you encoded on a molecule. Very amazing, really. And uh, where did you get your information in your DNA? You got it from your parents. They got it from their parents. It's been copied many times. But ultimately, it has to go back to a mind, according to the laws of information science. And that, of course, is exactly what we'd expect, given what the Bible says about creation. This idea that mutations accumulate in DNA and, and gradually add information, that's contrary to laws of science. It's contrary to the, the law of uh, information transmission. Mutations might convey survival value under certain circumstances. That does happen, but they don't increase information. Dr. Lee Spetner, one of the world's experts on mutations, says all point mutations that have been studied on the molecular level <laughs> turn out to reduce the genetic information, not to increase it. And in some rare instances, that, that loss can actually help you survive. But, but uh, in any case, it, it, it doesn't help. It, doesn't, it, it can't be responsible for the information we have in our DNA. He says not even one mutation has been observed that adds a little information to the genome. Isn't that interesting? And so when we study genetics and, and information science, we find it confirms Genesis creation. It, it's inconsistent with the idea of evolution. The millions of years of random processes generating the information in our DNA, not possible according to the laws of science as we understand them. I like to hit the time scale of uh, creation. That's something where there's some controversy, but there really shouldn't be. The Bible's very clear that in six days God created the heaven and the earth and all that's in them. And we find science that confirms that. You may have heard that science has proved billions of years. Well, it hasn't. In fact, there's a lot, there are a lot of lines of evidence that are inconsistent with billions of years. People think carbon dating gives billions of years. It never does. Carbon dating is our friend. Carbon dating gives thousands of years. Even on things that evolutionists believe to be millions of years old or hundreds of millions of years old, like coal beds, you can take a chunk of coal, carbon date it, you'll get thousands of years. doesn't matter how deep down you find it. Isn't that interesting? It still has C14 in it. C14 is an unstable isotope of carbon. Most carbon is C12, but C14 has two extra neutrons, and it decays into nitrogen in a time scale of something like 5,700 years. And so it can't last millions of years. If the entire Earth were made of C14 in one million years, it would be gone. It would all be nitrogen. It doesn't last that long. Yet we find C14 in diamonds that are alleged to be one to two billion years old. But you see, they can't even be one million years old, or they would be gone. And evolutionists cry, well, there's some kind of contamination. How? It's a diamond. It's the hardest substance. How are you going to get new C14 in there? You see, it doesn't make any sense, but it does make sense in light of the, the biblical time scale of thousands of years. And so we, we find that uh, geology and, and, and physics and radiometric dating, when, it's, when the proper assumptions are made, confirms biblical creation. We could move out into the realm of outer space. That's my area of expertise. Talk about things like comets. Comets are made up of ice and dirt, and they orbit around the sun in elliptical paths. They spend most of their time far away, but they come close and they get slingshotted back out. And when that ice and dirt gets close to the sun, ice close to the sun, that can't be good, right? And uh, in fact, that's what causes a comet's tail. That's material being blasted away from the nucleus of the comet, being vaporized by solar heat and pushed away by solar uh, wind and solar radiation pressure. And so every time you see a comet, it's losing material. It's getting smaller. And we know the amount of material that's there. We can measure that. We can see it leaving. We can measure the rate at which it's leaving. And you can compute a maximum time span, and for a typical comet, it's about 100,000 years, which may sound like a lot, but again, in the secular view, the solar system is supposed to be 4.5 billion years old. Why do we still have comets then? That's what I want to know. I think that's very compelling. I've seen comets. I used the SOHO spacecraft in my doctoral dissertation, and, I've, and it's designed to look right at the sun, and it, it, one of the instruments on it can detect comets as they come close to the sun. They swing by, and sometimes they go back behind the sun, and that's it. They're totally obliterated in one pass. They just don't last that long. They're like the ice cream cones of the solar system. You know, if you, if you were in a sauna and you saw some ice cream cones sitting there starting to melt, you would probably conclude those haven't been there very long, right? <laughs> That's what comets are. Now, all these lines of evidence, and I could present many more. I do other presentations on this where I go through the science, and I think it's good to know some of these things. These are good lines of evidence, and they do confirm biblical creation, but they, they fall short of a proof. <laughs> They're less than a proof because for every line of evidence that I've presented, an evolutionist can always come up with what we might call a rescuing device. He can come up with a hypothesis to protect his worldview from what appears to be contrary evidence. And so in the case of comets, my secular colleagues are well aware of this problem. They, they know that comets 
disintegrate quickly. They can do the same math I can do. They, and, and you'd think they'd come to the same conclusion, but they can't because they believe in billions of years. And so what they say is, well, there must be a, a comet generator that makes new comets to replace the old ones, which they call the Oort cloud. If you've ever heard of the Oort cloud, that is not something that anyone has ever observed. It is a rescuing device. It's a hypothesis that is designed to protect the, uh, the worldview, the secular worldview, from what is apparently contrary evidence. Now, if I were to ask a secularist, do you have any observational evidence of an Oort cloud? If he's honest, he'll say, well, no. And if he's clever, he'll say, but you can't prove it's not there. And that's true. I can't disprove the existence of an undetectable comet generator. <laughs> See, the, <laughs> the idea is they, they've designed it so that we can't detect it. It's, it. The idea is it's beyond the farthest planets. You see this big swar swarm of potential comets well beyond our ability to detect them. And then the idea is every now and then one of them is thrown into the inner solar system and becomes a brand new comet. So as the old ones disintegrate, new ones replace them. Pretty clever. But there's no evidence for it. It's a rescuing device. And for every line of scientific evidence, if you put it up against a sufficiently clever person, he will be able to come up with a rescuing device. If they can't, it just means they're not very clever. That's all it means, okay? So uh, you got to be careful about how you use evidence. It does have con uh, confirmatory power, but it's not a proof. You can say, well, what about information in DNA? They could say, well, sure, there's no known process that generates it, but give us time. There must be some undiscovered process that builds up that information. What about the C14 in diamonds? They'd say, well, there's, there's some kind of contamination. We don't know what would cause that yet, but give us time, we'll find it, right? I call that the eschatological... Uh, cop out, right? Give, give me time. In the future, I'll have an answer. Well, and before we're too harsh, we need to realize that Christians have our rescuing devices too. If somebody asks you about an alleged contradiction in Scripture, maybe a section you're not really all that familiar with, and you look at that and you say, yeah, I don't know what the answer is right now. Your first inclination is not to say, well, can't be a Christian anymore, got to throw that away. Your first inclination is to say, well, I know this is the Word of God. He doesn't contradict himself, so I know there's an answer. Give me time, I'll find it right? So we all have our rescuing devices. That's not the point. The point is, how do we deal with these competing worldviews? Because I'm looking at the evidence from my Christian perspective. The Bible's the Word of God. It's got the true history of the universe. I'm looking at, I look at comets and I draw the conclusion, yep, young solar system. That's what I'd expect. My secular colleague is looking at the same evidence and he thinks, yep, Oort cloud, right? I mean, it's consistent, with his way of thinking and with the evidence. We all have, if you think about it, we all have the same facts. Creationists and evolutionists look at the same universe. We have access to the same fossils, access to the same DNA, genetic patterns. I look at the same stars and gal galaxies as my secular colleagues. We do science this pretty much the same way. I do, you know, study physics and mathematics and things like that in terms of the way I do my calculations. Why then do we come to such different conclusions? And the answer is because we have a different starting point. We have a different worldview, a different way of thinking about the evidence. And you can't get away from that. That's, that's human nature. We, ha we interpret evidence, and you interpret it in light of your worldview, your way of thinking about things, which I like to liken unto mental glasses. Only some of us wear glasses physically, but we all wear glasses mentally. We all have a way of thinking about things, and that colors how we observe the world. I like to think of the Bible like prescription lenses that are designed just for you. They're corrective lenses. They give you the correct view of history. And when you look out into the world, it snaps into focus and you see things as they really are. I like to think of evolution like red glasses. You put on red glasses, you look at the world, you say, everything is red. How about that? Well, it's not red, but that's what you see because of those glasses that you're wearing. And of course, I realize that evolutionists will say, no, we're wearing the right glasses. You're wearing the wrong glasses. We'll have to argue for that. But my point is we all have a worldview which consists of our presuppositions, our most basic beliefs about reality. A presupposition is not just any old assumption. It's a very basic assumption that you assume before you investigate evidence. And we all have them. We all have, we all believe, for example, in the basic reliability of our senses. You believe that what you see and hear and taste and so on is, corresponds to reality. You couldn't function apart from that. Or the reliability of your memory. How do you know that your memory is basically reliable, that what you remember actually happened? Now you might say, well, I took a memory test two weeks ago, Dr. Lyle. I did very well on it. I got an A on it. How do you know you took a memory test two weeks ago, right? <laughs> well, I remember, ta oh yeah, there's the problem. You have to presuppose that your memory is reliable in order to argue you correctly remember that your memory is reliable. 
And so it is with any presupposition. It must be assumed at the outset. The reliability of senses is an example of that. If you go to a, you know, along the side of the road, you see a rock, and you say, I'm going to do an experiment on this, find out what it's made of and whatever, and I'm going to have totally a blank slate. I'm not going to have any assumptions. Well, you've already presupposed that the rock is there just because you saw it. You've presupposed your senses are reliable. That's a presupposition. So people might say, oh, no, not me. I don't have these presuppositions. I believe we ought to come to evidence neutrally without <laughs> beliefs. But that is itself a belief about how evidence should be interpreted, isn't it? The philosophy that you should come to the evidence without a philosophy is itself a philosophy. It's just a very bad one because it's self-refuting. And so you can't get away from that. You can't get away from having presuppositions. That's an inescapable. You can, however, get away from having correct presuppositions. And that's the problem. Creationists and evolutionists have different sets of presuppositions, and all your presuppositions together are your worldview. It's a network of presuppositions in light of which all evidence is interpreted. We have different rules for interpreting the evidence, and so that's why we can look at exactly the same fossil and come to very different conclusions about how it got there, what it means, what is its significance. And ultimately, our presuppositions, will, are, they're hierarchical, and, they, and some are more basic than others, and you ultimately have an ultimate standard. Everyone does. And for the creationist, the Bible should be the ultimate standard. Perhaps it isn't for all creationists. I wish it were, because it should be. The Bible should be our ultimate standard. I mean, if this really is the inerrant word of God, it would be ridiculous to start with anything else. The God in whom is all truth? Why start with anything else? Why start with guesswork when you can start with certainty? And by the way, I do have secondary standards. I do believe that my senses are basically reliable, but that's not my ultimate standard because I know my senses can be fooled. If you've ever seen an optical illusion, you know your senses can be fooled, right? Or have you seen, you know, somebody puts a, a beam of wood in water at an angle and it looks like the wood bends when it goes under the water because of the way the light refracts and so on. Now you've got a, you've got a problem, right? Because you, well, I, I see it bending, but does it really bend? No, because you've got a greater presupposition that tells you that th you know, th things stay straight under the water. Or you could even reach in and feel it. Well, it still feels straight. Now you've got a problem because you've got one sense telling you one thing and another sense telling you something else. Your presuppositions will, will uh, decide for you which, which of those you're going to uh, believe. But the Bible should be our ultimate and unquestionable standard. For the evolutionist, the Bible is not their ultimate standard. We can certainly say that. What is their standard? And it depends because there are different varieties of evolutionists out there. But often the ultimate standard for the evolutionist is naturalism. The belief that nature is all that there is. It's the whole show. There's no God. Or <laughs> if there is, he's within nature and doesn't really do anything. Or strict empiricism, the belief that all truth claims are answered by observation. You want to know something, go out and touch it and taste it, do an experiment, whatever. That's often the ultimate standard for the evolutionist. And so how then, are, how then can we settle the debate? We can't settle the debate simply by throwing evidence at each other, which is the way most people try to resolve these things. There's a problem with these evidential type arguments. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with using evidence to start a conversation or using it to, to challenge evolutionary ideas, but my point is it's not decisive. It doesn't settle the issue when, it, when it's a worldview issue, when people have competing worldviews. And the reason is because your worldview tells you what the evidence means. The worldview is superior, as it were, to the evidence. It judges it, tells you what, what to make of it. And I've got a silly example I like to use for this. There was a man who thought that he was dead. He thought that he himself was dead. He's very concerned about this. He doesn't like being dead. Of course, he's, you know, he's perfectly healthy. And his doctor's telling him that. You're perfectly healthy. You're walking and talking. And the fellow says, well, yeah, but you know, bodies can have muscle spasms even after clinical death. That could explain my ability to walk and talk. The doctor says, but look, I've got medical charts showing you're perfectly healthy. And the guy says, yeah, but medical charts, those can be falsified, and maybe the names got swapped on it. Who knows if you're interpreting it right? The doctor says, okay, I'm going to prove to you that you're not dead. Can, do dead men bleed? And the guy, well, you know, the circulatory system we've spelled, no, dead men don't bleed. And the doctor very quickly takes a little pin, pricks the guy in the hand, a little bit of blood comes to see you're bleeding, to which our man responds, well, how about that? I guess dead men do bleed. <laughs> huh. Silly example, of course, but did the doctor have evidence for his position? Absolutely. And it was good evidence. There's nothing wrong with the evidence. The guy could walk and talk, medical charts, the guy could bleed. Those are good lines of evidence. That's not the problem. The problem is the guy had a worldview, a presupposition 
that told him how to interpret each of those lines of evidence. In all cases, he was able to come up with a rescuing device to explain that evidence in such a way that it would fit in with his worldview. Do people really think like that? Yeah. If I wasn't convinced of that before going into ministry, I certainly am now. There's no doubt about that. You might have a great evidence that the Bible is true, and the world is full of lines of evidence uh, that the Bible's true. In fact, if you really understand my argument, every evidence is an evidence that the Bible's true. And you show that to somebody. You say, see how fossils are we, all over the world? We find fossils um, that were formed by, you know, rock layers laid, laid, laid down by water. That would, a worldwide flood would make sense of that. Of course you'd expect to find fossils all over the earth. That's what we find. But is the secularist going to be convinced by that? Probably not, because he's not going to look at it the right way. See, I'm looking at that evidence properly through the lens of Scripture. My secular colleague looks at that same evidence, and he says, well, that's not how I see it. He says, here's how I think those fossils were formed. I think they were deposited over millions of years by local floods and so on. No worldwide flood, after all. And the funny thing is, the Christian sometimes is inclined to think, well, yeah, it didn't convince him, so maybe that evidence, that evidence isn't as good as I thought it was. In reality, the evidence is fine. It's the person's glasses that need to be adjusted. So we, but we throw that away. We say, well, how about now? Here's this other evidence. Let me show you this. Look how canyons can form quickly. We know that. Mount St. Helens proved that. It carved out a canyon 140th the scale of the Grand Canyon in a matter of days at most. We know canyons can form quickly. He says, yeah, but just because that one did doesn't mean the Grand Canyon formed quickly. It took millions of years. He said, well, yeah, I guess it doesn't prove it, does it? Well, let's try something else. How about now? We know rock layers can be laid down quickly. They don't take millions of years. Mount St. Helens proved that as well. He says, yeah, but just because those ones do doesn't mean these ones do. The, most of the, these ones, we think, take millions of years. Oh, but, but look, uh, animals reproduce according to their kinds, right? Dogs always beget dogs and so on. That's what we'd expect in creation. He says, sure, but given enough time, one kind can change into another. Just, you know, you just haven't observed it long enough. But look, we find evidence in DNA. It's got information in it. Information always comes from a mind, confirms Genesis. He says, well, there could be some undiscovered mechanism that produces information. Give us time, we'll find it. But, but look, we find, you know, out in space, things like comets that can't last billions of years. He says, no problem, there's an Oort cloud that makes new ones. You see, for every line of evidence, there is a rescuing device, if the person's sufficiently clever. You might be able to... Uh, bully someone into believing something, you know, if they're not able to come up with a rescuing device. But even that, uh, first of all, I'm not sure that's ethical. And secondly, they could go off to somebody who is an expert and get a rescuing device from them. So it's better to have good arguments. And, and by the way, I'm not suggesting for a moment that it's wrong to show people evidence. I think it's good to show people some evidence. For one thing, people have been so trained, so brainwashed to think about things from this perspective, they're not even aware that there is another way to look at it. And so I think it's good to do some of this. I think it's good to show people some scientific evidence that confirms creation and challenges their worldview. It's good to make them come up with a few rescuing devices okay, so that they can see what they're doing. But my point is, a philosophically astute person will not be persuaded by mere evidence when it's a worldview issue, nor should he be. So it is good to show people evidence and how the Bible makes sense of it. This by itself will not resolve a debate over worldviews because your worldview tells you what to make of the evidence. And I think the reason that people don't often get this is because we spend most of our time with people that have the same worldview <laughs> that we do. And when you have the same worldview, evidence does persuade, right? If you and I had a disagreement about whether or not there are crackers in the cupboard, we could settle that by going up, over to the cupboard, opening up, there's the crackers, I was right. And because we have the same worldview, you'd say, yeah, okay, we, we come to agreement. If I'm arguing with somebody who is a Hindu who believes the world is illusion, it's all Maya, could I open up the the pantry and persuade them that way? Well, no, because they say, well, yeah, I see it, but that's illusion too, you see. If you have a different worldview, the evidence by itself is not going to settle the matter, okay? It's not decisive. Useful, but not decisive. And that's the problem. A lot of creationists and evolutionists talk past each other they, because they assume that the other party ought to interpret the evidence the same way they do. <laughs> and they get frustrated when they don't. So how do we settle this debate then? It's not about the evidence, really, it's about how it should be interpreted. How do we settle that? I'm going to give you the wrong answer before I give you the right answer, because I want to show you what often happens. It's usually the, the, the person who has these secular presuppositions, he'll propose this solution. He'll say, well, what we can do then, because you're interpreting the evidence that way and I'm interpreting it this way, surely there are some things we can agree on, and we'll meet in the middle then, we'll meet on neutral ground, 
Okay, so you give up the presuppositions that I don't agree with. and, and we, we agree on things like science, right? And so that's neutral. And so we'll meet in the middle. And, but you, I, don't, I don't believe in the Bible, he says. So you got to give that up. Hmm. And a lot of Christians fall for that. But what does the Bible say about neutral ground when it comes to a worldview issue? No such thing. Uh, Jesus says, he who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. You're with Christ or you're against him. Uh, the mindset on the flesh is what? Neutral toward God? No, no, it's hostile toward God. It does not subject itself to the law of God. It's not even able to do so. So forget this neutrality idea. Do not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God. Therefore, whoever who wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. There is a dichotomy here. These are two antagonistic worldviews. There is no neutral position. The fact that Jesus says there's no neutral position ought to settle that matter. In fact, the nature of the claim makes it impossible to have a neutral position. And my mentor on this topic, Dr. Bonson, liked to call this the pretended neutrality fallacy. The idea that, oh, okay, I'm, we're going to pretend there's neutral, but there is no neutral. See, the Bible claims there's no neutral. So if you say, well, yes, there is neutral, and I'm neutral, you've just said the Bible's wrong, in which case you're not being neutral. You see, the claim of neutrality is a non-neutral claim. It's immediately self-refuting. And you're going to have to point that out to people. People will not get that at first because secularists like to think they're very objective and very neutral. And oh, I would, I would be a Christian if only, I were, if only there was evidence for it. <laughs> well, the Bible tells us there's abundant evidence for it, but they suppress the truth and unrighteousness. They're not neutral. And you're going to have to explain to them that by making the claim you're neutral, you've already decided the Bible's wrong. Because the Bible says there is no neutral. You've already made a stand. That's the, that's the issue. You see, when the secularist says, let's meet on neutral ground, there are things we can agree on and so on. There's this middle position. The Bible disallows that. And if Christians agree to that, yeah, we can give up the Bible. Well, neutral ground is secular ground. The Bible disallows that possibility. And if you agree to those terms, you're pretty well lost right at the outset. Because isn't the debate really about whether or not this is true? Isn't that what it's really about? And if you start the debate by saying this isn't true, at least about neutrality, you've lost at the outset. You cannot defend biblical authority by abandoning biblical authority. That's not a good debate strategy to dis concede defeat at the first moment. That doesn't work. Evolutionists like to think they're very neutral. They're going to want you to be very neutral. Two things to remember when people ask you to be neutral. One, they're not. Two, you shouldn't be. No one is neutral when it comes to a worldview issue. You shouldn't try to be neutral when it... God hasn't called us to be neutral. He's called us to be Christians. No one can approach scientific evidence without presuppositions one way or the other. You can't be neutral. The best thing you can do is to be aware of what your presuppositions are and see if they make sense. The man of God is to hold fast the faithful word, which is in accordance with the teaching, so that he will be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and refute those who contradict. We stand on the word, even when we're challenging people who are not standing on the word. And the funny thing is evolutionists will say, well, that's circular reasoning. You can't stand on what you're trying to defend. Meanwhile, they're standing on evolution trying to defend it. Uh, it seems to me when it comes to an ultimate standard, you have to stand on what you're trying to defend because there's no greater standard upon which you could stand, if you see what I'm saying. In battle, you can stand on a hill while you're defending the hill. That's the best place to be. You ever had something in your eye, and you go to a mirror, and you can you know, examine your eye using your eye, and even correct your eye using your eye. So there's nothing fallacious about that. What's the right answer then? How do we show that biblical presuppositions are the way to go? And the answer it's, comes from Scripture itself. It's, it, what I want to suggest to you is that biblical presuppositions and only biblical presuppositions will make it possible to know anything at all or to have any kind of argument about anything. So these presuppositions are self-defeating. These ones are self-attesting. That's what it comes down to. And the, the Bible itself teaches that. Proverbs 1, seven: the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. You want to begin to know anything, you've got to start with God and therefore his presuppositions. You reject that, the Bible says you're a fool. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Christ, deposited in Christ. Not some, all. You want to know anything, it's got to be through God. God is the sender of all possible knowledge. He's the source of all knowledge. We're the recipients of some. And the, there's an objection to this. People will say, but wait a minute, non-Christians do know some things. That's true, they do. 
So how do we explain that? If, if in Christ, if in God is all knowledge, how is it that these unbelievers who don't even believe in God know things? And the answer is, they really do know God. They're made in his image too, and God's revealed himself to them. They suppress that truth and unrighteousness. That's, that's the issue. God has revealed himself inescapably to people. <coughs> Romans 1 teaches that. The wrath of God's revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. It doesn't say they just don't know any better. It says they suppress what they know to be true. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. God has hardwired people to know that he exists and to know some, some of his presuppositions. And I grant we can't know everything about God just from the innate knowledge that he's given us. I mean, you couldn't know necessarily that he made in seven days apart from, or six days and rested one apart from the scriptures. But we can know the basics of God, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. God's hardwired us to know uh, something about him. And therefore, even unbelievers can have knowledge because they know God. And they just inconsistently reject him as their Lord and Savior. So my argument, you see, is that only the Bible can make sense of those things that are necessary for knowledge. And I'm going to spell this out to show you how this works. But my, my main argument that for the truth of the Bible is that if the Bible weren't true, you couldn't prove anything is true. It is the absolute foundation for all knowledge. And I want to uh, give some specific illustrations of this. In order for us to know anything about anything, the universe would have to be a certain way. And it turns out it's the way the Bible says the universe is. If the universe were different from the way the Bible says it is, we couldn't know anything. Let me give you some examples of this. Um, I think uh, laws of logic would be one example. We, so, some of the things we know, we know by logical reasoning. We conclude them from, pre, from certain premises and so on. Uh, but have you ever thought about where laws of logic come from, why they exist, why they have the properties they do, why do they not change with time and so on? The laws of logic stem from the mind of God, really. They're a reflection of the way God thinks and therefore the way we're supposed to think. The Christian has a standard for correct reasoning, and that standard is God. And so we can have laws of logic. But you see, in a chance universe, why would there be any laws at all? Why would there be laws of logic in particular? Why would they have the properties that they do? Who decides what they are? Right? Why is it that laws of logic, for example, don't change with time? You know that the law of non-contradiction, right? The, you can't have A and not A at the same time in the same relationship. We all assume that works just as well on Thursdays as it does on Saturdays. Now, why is that? As a Christian, I can account for that because God doesn't change. He's beyond time. And if laws of logic are a reflection of his thinking, they're not going to change with time either. God's consistent. But from a, in a chance universe, how do you know that laws of logic will work tomorrow? It's chance universe. Anything could happen. So you see, laws of logic are predicated on the truth of God's word or uniformity in nature. The idea that uh, in, in basic ways, nature is uniform. That if, you know, if, if there was gravity today, there'll be gravity tomorrow. Presumably, when you got up this morning, you didn't brace yourself just in case gravity should send you hurtling toward the ceiling. Presumably, you assumed that gravity pulls down as it has in the past. Now, that makes sense in a Christian worldview because God has promised us a certain degree of uniformity in nature. Genesis 8.22, he promises the basic cycles of nature will be in the future as they have been in the past until Judgment Day. And so we, I can count on a certain degree of uniformity. And yet all science is predicated on that. All science is predicated on the fact that God upholds the universe in a consistent way, in a way that the human mind can at least partially understand because our minds made, were made in God's image, and so we have a limited, degree to, limited ability to be rational and to, and to observe the evidence. Our senses are reliable because God made them, and so they can probe the universe. If we're just rearranged pond scum, science makes no sense at all. Why would you expect one chemical accident would be able to understand all other chemical accidents? It makes no sense. You go out and start your car in the morning, and it doesn't start. Ever had that happen? Uh. It probably doesn't occur to you to think, well... You know, it's a chance universe, so frankly, I'm surprised it worked this long. <laughs> yeah? I guess the laws of physics and chemistry don't work anymore. <laughs> it doesn't occur to you. What, what does occur to you is some, the, the situation has changed, right? The battery maybe is dead, or there's a solenoid that's bad, or something like that. It doesn't occur to you to think that the basic cycles of nature are different now. And yet, in a chance universe, there's no reason why that shouldn't be the case. In a chance universe, anything could happen. You get up and stub your toe in the middle of the night. You get up and drink water and it's dark and you stub your toe on something. Oh, that hurts, right? Now, the next night when you get up to get a drink of water, 
you're very careful not to stub your toe again. You say, this time I'm going to take it really slow. This time I'm going to go and turn on the lights. Okay? Why? Because you assume if you stub your toe again, it will hurt again. And as a Christian, you have the right to assume that because God upholds things in a consistent way. But in a chance universe, anything could happen. It's a chance universe. Why should you expect any kind of uniformity at all? Maybe the next time I stub my toe, it'll be the most enjoyable experience of a lifetime, right? <laughs> you see, all the things we take for granted to know anything about anything are predicated on Scripture, on the biblical worldview. I think the easiest of these three to understand is absolute morality, by which we have knowledge of right and wrong. Right and wrong, that doesn't even make sense in an atheistic universe. In a chance universe, what happens simply happens. There's no right or wrong about it. It's just chemical reactions, atoms doing what atoms do. Who decides what morality should be in a chance universe? And why should I behave in a particular way? See, it makes, it makes no sense. You can't be defended. But in a scriptural worldview, yeah, God made us. He's got the right to make the rules. He's going to hold me accountable for my actions. And so I have a very good reason to behave in a particular way. I can account for absolute morality. And it's, it's objective. It's the same for all people because God is sovereign over the entire universe. And uh, in fact, all these things are that way as well. The reason laws of logic we assume work just as well in the Andromeda galaxy as they do here is because God is sovereign over all. His thinking permeates the entire universe and, and, and controls the entire universe. Or uniformity in nature. We assume that laws of nature work the same on Mars as they do on Earth. And every time NASA has a success, it's because they've assumed that. Because they've assumed the laws of physics work the same in space. And as a Christian, we have the right to assume that. Now, my point is not that Secularists don't believe in these things. My point is they do. And yet on their worldview, those things would make no sense whatsoever. Secularists have no logical foundation for logic itself or for uniformity in nature or for any absolute morality. And so when, when my secular colleagues will hear me say things like, you know, absolute morality is based on God's word, they'll say, hey, but I'm, you know, I'm basically moral and so on, and I say, hey, I'm not saying you don't have a sense of morality. My, my point is, you shouldn't. <laughs> if your worldview were true, you shouldn't. He says, but I can use laws of logic. I believe in logic. My point is, you shouldn't. If your worldview were true, you shouldn't. I believe in the methods of science. Yes, but if your worldview were true, you shouldn't. Because science makes no sense in a chance universe. See, on the surface, it may seem like you've just got these two competing worldviews, and it's just Personal preference. You like blue, do you like flame color? You, want, you like the Bible, you like the secular worldview, take your pick. But what we're going to find when we examine these worldviews carefully, when we open them up, we're going to find the biblical worldview can lead to knowledge. It makes sense. It makes knowledge possible. The secular worldview, when we examine it carefully, cannot possibly go anywhere. It can't work. It can't lead to knowledge. It's, it's self-contradictory. And one way you can reveal that is an internal critique, where you examine the worldview on its own terms and show that it blows itself up. Relativism is an example of this. You've heard relativists. They'll say everything's relative, right? There are no absolutes. That's true for you. It's not true for me. That, those sorts of things. And uh, all things are relative. There are no absolutes. And of course, the question you want to ask is, are you absolutely certain? The, uh, the statement, there are no absolutes, is an absolute statement. If it's true, it's false. Therefore, it's false. Easy to refute these worldviews. Uh, strict empiricism. Now, I mentioned earlier, many evolutionists are strict empiricists. They believe that all truth claims are proved by empirical observation. If you can't observe it with your own eyes or in, you know, with your own senses, then you shouldn't believe it. And the interesting thing I'm going to have to ask is, how do you know the statement itself is true? Did you prove it by empirical observation? Now, think about that. The statement that all truth claims are proved by empirical observation is itself a truth claim, isn't it? And it's one that you cannot prove by empirical observation because nobody has observed all truth claims. In fact, you can't really observe a truth claim anyway. It's abstract. It, but even if you could, you can't observe all of them because there's an infinite number of truth claims. So he says, if you can't observe it, you shouldn't believe it. Well, that statement is something I can't observe, and therefore I shouldn't believe your statement. It's self-refuting. Secular worldviews are always self-refuting. And not just secular worldviews. Any worldview apart from Christianity inevitably blows itself up on its own terms. All of them do that. And I know that's true because God's told me that, that his word alone is what makes knowledge possible. All truth is in Christ, right? And so it's only in the biblical worldview. All worldviews circle. That's, that's inevitable. The Bible circles in such a way that it makes all knowledge, it makes knowledge possible. And it comes back and confirms itself. It's self-attesting. Every alternative to the Bible 
blows itself up when it comes back around. Now, I think that's a pretty good proof of the Christian worldview, the fact that no other worldview is logically possible. No other worldview makes knowledge possible. The Bible alone does that. And it claims that itself, so I'm not departing from biblical authority when I make that claim. It's a biblical claim. So it may seem at first like there's no way to resolve the issue. I'm standing over here on my biblical presuppositions. The Bible's true. There are absolutes from God. Laws of logic stem from the mind of God, morality, uh, uniformity in nature by which we uh, have induction. My secular colleague is standing on maybe some combination of those things, maybe not all of them, but some combination. He believes in nature is all that there is, or empiricism, or relativism, neutrality. The Bible's irrelevant to science. It may seem at first like we can't get anywhere because we've already seen you can't just throw evidence at each other. If the person's clever, he'll just reinterpret it according to his own worldview anyway. There's no neutral ground. Can't meet in the middle. But one of the things we need to recognize is that secular presuppositions are sinking sand. They will not support a worldview. They are self-refuting. And when that sand dissolves away, the unbeliever is left in a rather awkward position. He cannot stand on his own worldview. So what do unbelievers do? They do that. Unbelievers will stand on Christian presuppositions because they have to. They have to. See, all non-Christian worldviews are like that. They cannot stand on their own worldview. And so all non-Christian worldviews, to some extent, must steal Christian presuppositions. It's inevitable. And they're able to do that because they, have, they do have knowledge of God. It's a suppressed knowledge of God, but they do have it. They know that God's real in their heart of hearts. They know that. They might not like being made in God's image, but they can't escape being made in God's image. They have to live in God's universe, and therefore they're going to have to play by God's rules if they're going to survive. And so they will inconsistently borrow Christian presuppositions. Uh, They can't help themselves. I like to think of unbelievers like presuppositional kleptomaniacs. They just compulsively steal from the Christian worldview. They can't help themselves. They have to in order to survive. And, of course, they're, they're going to deny that, right? They're going to say, oh, no, laws of logic, that's not a Christian presupposition. Well, really it is. There's no basis for laws of logic apart from the Christian worldview. Why you'd have these absolute, unchanging, universal standards of truth, that doesn't make sense in a chance universe. So we do have common ground. We don't have neutral ground. We do have common ground. But it's not neutral because it belongs to God. Unbelievers must stand on Christian presuppositions. So my point about creation and Christianity in general, is that it must be true because it provides the intellectual ground on which everyone must stand, whether they acknowledge it or not. You can either be consistent and be a Christian, or you can be inconsistent, be irrational, and rely on inconsistently Christian presuppositions. Uh, By way of analogy, you can think of a debate over biblical creation or Christianity a lot like a debate on the existence of air. Can you imagine two people debating whether or not air exists? What would the critic of air say? He's making all these long-winded arguments about how air doesn't exist, all the while breathing air and expecting that we can hear his arguments as the sound is transmitted through the air. You see, the critic of air has to use air in order to make a case against air. The very fact that he's able to make his argument proves that his argument is wrong. And so it is with biblical creation or any aspect of the Bible. The critic of the Bible must use biblical presuppositions in order to argue against the Bible. And so the fact that he's able to make his argument at all proves he's wrong. He's got to use God's laws of logic or uniformity in nature by which we get science, or he's going to make some kind of moral argument against the Bible. He's got to borrow Christian principles to do it. And they'll deny that, of course. They'll say, but wait a minute, I don't, I don't even believe in the Bible, and, and I can use laws of logic. Well, that would be like the critic of air saying, wait a minute, you're, you're saying I need air to breathe? I don't even believe in air, and I can breathe perfectly fine. Right? <laughs> I'm not saying you have to profess a belief in air, to breathe, but you do need air to breathe. I'm not saying you have to profess a belief in the Bible to think or be rational, but you do need the Bible to be true, to think or be rational. And so the secularist is standing on God's ground, stealing Christian principles, arguing against Christianity using those very principles, but if he succeeds, all he's going to do is blow up his own position. We had had a fun time thinking of ways to illustrate this. I kept thinking of those old uh, Roadrunner Coyote cartoons where he'd end up getting in his own trap. And that's really what it comes down to. It really is. The, uh, the secularist has to stand on Christian principles to argue against Christianity. And I'll just, uh, I'm going to skip a few of these for time's sake. I wish I could do this all, but our time is limited. 
I'll just uh, to drive this home. Morality, I think, is the one that people get get the most easily. Laws of logic, kind of abstract. Principles of science, most haven't most people haven't thought about how science is possible, but most people have thought about right and wrong. And yet, that makes no sense in a chance universe. Consider an evolutionist who's outraged at seeing a violent murder on television. He says, I can't believe that man shot that little girl. That's terrible. He should go to jail. Now, I'm glad the guy's angry, but my point is, it's inconsistent with his beliefs in evolution. Right? Because in his view, it's just one chemical accident rearranging another chemical accident. What's the big deal? Right? You, you mix uh, vinegar and baking soda, it fizzes. That's what it, chemistry does. You don't get mad at the baking soda. Bad baking soda. You shouldn't have fizzed up like that. Chemistry does what chemistry inevitably does. There's no choice in the matter if it's just chemistry. Or for that matter, if we're just evolved animals, animals kill each other all the time. If the lion kills the antelope, you don't put the lion in jail. You better think about what you did. Right? <laughs> animals do what animals do. There's a strategy uh, that, to reveal this inconsistency that I must uh, cover very quickly because we're almost out of time. It's called the don't answer answer strategy. This is this revolutionized the way I defend the Christian faith when I dis discovered this. It's right in Scripture. Proverbs 26, 4, Do not answer a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him. It's telling us we're not to embrace the presuppositions of the unbeliever, because if we do, we'd be like him. We'll be foolish, too. So if somebody comes to you and says, uh, let's leave the Bible out of the discussion, that's a foolish presupposition, especially if they're talking about origins. You know, we can talk about origins, but you got to leave the Bible out of it, because I don't believe in the Bible. Well, that's absurd. That's ridiculous. Let's leave the Bible out of the discussion. No, you, you don't want to agree to that because if you do, you'll be like him. And you can't really get anywhere. You've both rejected biblical authority then, and now you're reduced to foolishness. On the other hand, the Bible says, answer a fool according to his folly, so he can't be wise in his own eyes. It may sound like a contradiction at first, but the sense is different. On the one hand, we shouldn't embrace the presuppositions of the unbeliever. On the other hand, we should show where they go so that he can't be wise in his own eyes, lest he think, well, I really proved a good point there. I won that debate. We want to show him that his own presuppositions are self-refuting. So somebody comes along and says, there are no absolutes. You want to point out, uh, actually, you just made an absolute statement. You see how silly that is? You reflect back his own philosophy to him so he can see the absurdity of it. You never put on the outfit, but you do show the absurdity of it by reflecting it back to him. So somebody, for example, as a silly example, somebody says, I, I don't believe in words. <laughs> Prove to me that creation is true, but you can't use words to do it because I don't believe in words. Wouldn't that be silly? Wouldn't it be ridiculous to agree to those terms and say, well, yeah, if you don't believe in words, I guess I can't use words. No, no, no. Use the don't answer, answer strategy. First of all, the don't answer part, you're going to say something like this. I don't accept your belief that words don't exist. Okay, you make it clear. I don't, I don't buy into your standard. You may not have to explicitly say it, but it, it needs to be there. You need to show that person, I don't, I don't accept your standard. But for the sake of argument, hypothetically, if words didn't exist, you couldn't argue anyway. Because you need words to do that. The fact that you're able to make your case demonstrates you're wrong. You just used words to tell me you don't believe in words. You see, you're reflecting that back. What's he going to say now? If, he's, if he says nothing, my point stands unrefuted. I win. If he says anything, he proves my point that words exist. I win. You see that? This is a brilliant strategy. And the Lord knew that. That's why he put it in Scripture for us. If you want to see somebody who used this idea, this, this strategy masterfully, take a look at Jesus and his earthly ministry. He knew how to do this. And Jesus was not the sort of person you wanted to debate against. He knew how to do it. And uh, I want to suggest to you that we can all learn how to do that. And it's, I wish I had more time to cover these, but uh, we're out. So I'm just going to uh, close with uh, 1 Peter 3.15. You, you know this verse, I'm sure, but, but sanctify uh, the Lord God in your hearts. So that's the key, is to recognize how, how God, everything depends on him. And then you'll be ready to give a defense and to do it with gentleness and respect. And it's all the more important that we remember that gentleness and res respect because you can slice and dice your opponents using this method. We need to do it graciously. And the, uh, the books that I've got, we've got, um, we've got some, we got free books out there for you. I hope that you'll pick those up on the way out. Uh, now, some of the stuff that I would encourage you to get, we don't have here, but we'll have it at the conference that's coming up in a couple of weeks, the Unlocking the Mysteries conference. And I hope you'll get those. The Ultimate Proof of Creation, my book on this topic, I hope you'll get that and read through it. It really will give you a very powerful and irrefutable defense of the faith. And I would encourage you to check that out. Lots of others, uh, Discerning Truth, How to Spot Logical Fallacies and Evolutionary Arguments, very helpful. 
for the Christian apologist. Uh, this one we're going to give you today. And this is one of the best books on creation written by all of our scientists at ICR uh, on different fields. And it gives you just the basics of science on these issues. It is helpful to know that. Even though that's not my ultimate proof of creation, it is good to know the basics on these things. And I won't go through all these for time's sake. But there, we have some wonderful resources I encourage you to check out. If you're, you're getting Acts and Facts, everybody getting Acts and Facts magazine? Okay, if you're not, we a sign-up sheet out there. It's free. And uh, we want to just bless you with that. It's a monthly magazine that will just encourage you uh, with the latest confirmations of the Christian worldview. And check us out on the web as well, icr.org. Is our website. All of our books you can get on the website there. Uh, YourOriginsMatter.com is our student ministry, but uh, we'd be we'd be happy for you to get on there and interact with some of the students there. We geared it mainly for high school and college students, uh, but anybody can get on there really. And I have a blog as well you might want to check out where I use what I've shown you today, and I let evolutionists comment on my blog, and it's we get a lot of fun on that blog. So they tell me how stupid I am, and then it's interesting. So you might want to check that out as well. So thank you very much for having me out to speak. Let's go ahead and close in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for, uh, thank you for the, the blessing that I've get, got to experience here today, Lord. I pray that you would just uh, let this message permeate in, that we could recognize just that your word is true from the beginning, that it is our ultimate foundation for all things, and that we would stand boldly, confident that your word is true from the beginning, and learn to see science as secondary, something that's confirming of Scripture, but not something that's superior to it. It's the Word of God. It's your Word, Lord, that is ultimate. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.